Welcome to the Dream Power Show, where your dreams turn into reality. Here is your host, Debbie Spector Weissman. Welcome to the Dream Power Show. I'm your host, Debbie Spector Weissman, the Dream Coach. Well, it's a new year with new beginnings, new adventures, and of course, new dreams. But we're all asking ourselves the question, what is going to happen this year? Will this be the year our dreams come into fruition? Or will other events get in the way? Maybe the answer lies in the stars. And for this, I'm bringing on my guest, Sharita Starr. Sharita is a known astrologer, numerologist, and lexigrammist, and has appeared on countless TV and radio programs. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Sharita. Thank you, Debbie, and happy, happy new year to you, too. And to you, too. Sharita, when you put together your overview of a year, you give it a title. Last year, it was Reachable and Teachable. This year, you say we need to awaken to the unexpected. What do you mean by this? Quite a shift in difference. Um, and being reachable and teachable in 2019 was the key uh, part of how people are going to navigate with success versus frustration during 2020. Uh, 2019 was very much about stepping up to the truth, becoming exposed if that wasn't what you were doing. Uh, so people who are not, you know, crossing over into 2020, standing in the truth and allowed themselves to learn what they needed to learn uh, during 2019. I hate to say that 2020 is not going to be an easy year for you because you didn't do the work of 2019. Um, and not to like cast fear on anybody or anything, but this year is a turbulent one. It is not uh, what we would say in astrology, a smooth ride. Uh, we have a lot of inner planet retrograde activity, uh, which is coming from not only the regular uh, Mercury retrograde, which of course I do many workshops and specialize in, so to speak. And uh, so this year is there are only, as I looked to the outlook of this entire year, there are only four months out of the entire year that there is no retrograde, inner planet retrograde activity. And when we have uh, multitudes of inner planet retrograde activity, it means we're not meant to be going forward per se. Or whatever we're doing to try to go forward, we're going to find there's mishaps, there's delays, there's just things not working in a flow, in a, in a, you know, in that seamless and effortless way that, you know, everybody wants their life to go. Um, when there's interplanet retrograde activity, such as will be uh, happening and unfolding in 2020, um, overlapping the Mercury retrogrades, intertwining with eclipse season coming up in the summertime, it's just a kind of a wait and see year versus a lot of progress. Um, in a way that if you want to get rich quick and you want to do all these things, you may not find that you're going to have your grace uh, as you may want. Um, and of course, titling this year as a theme, Awakening the Unexpected, we're guided, we're switching our gears this year because last year was all about being uh, the universal year was a three vibration. So you took 2019, you just spread out the numbers and you'll, you arrived at a 12. And the 12 represents uh, uh, energy that wants us to be that student, to be reachable, to be teachable, to be able to learn and grow on some level and always, always stand in the truth. So when we look to 2020, we uh, add everything up and we, we arrive at a four. So we're in the next sequence, but we're just that pure energy of four. And four is all about the unexpected. It is guided by Uranus. So we're going to switch our planetary focus and not that Jupiter is important because he certainly most certainly is. And we'll, we'll get to that about what's all this concentrated energy in Capricorn that if you are following astrology, you've probably heard about already. Um, but the uh, numerical guidance of 2020 is guided by Uranus, which is a very, it, it doesn't always have to be a unexpected thing, but it's not going to not have some shock factor. It's going to be a lot of surprises. And it's a lot of things that you need to have backup plans and you need to be prepared to not go the way you thought you were going to go in the first place. 
So there's like that change of direction very, very easily. Um, and when we look to things on like a global level, you're just going to see things left, right, and center. And not that we obviously have many things the media wants to distract our attention with from our own personal experiences, but 2020 is definitely going to be uh, amplifying those distractions tenfold. So on a personal level, we all need to make sure we honor our individualism and don't lose sight of what our part in the greater whole is. As much as we're gonna see some things that, again, a little bit of shock factor, lots of surprises, and of course, expect the unexpected. But it's more of an awakening, um, because when I look to the energy of looking at how everybody's always gonna keep saying 2020, we're all gonna keep saying 2020 or 2020, but 2020. So 20 on, on its own energy is, um, in the Chaldean karmic mystery that it represents is called the awakening. So we're gonna be kind of, I've also coined this year as it's the double awakening. There's a lot of things coming up. And again, when we're looking at the, the, that singular guidance of the four, four is also about foundation and structure and things falling into, you know, into a secure place. But this is the year where all of what we are used to is gonna become a little bit uncomfortable. And we're gonna be challenged on that level very much because the structures we have seen, the foundations we have seen are going to start to shift. Um, kind of like, um, and if you look on my uh, sharitastar.com and, and look at the, the article, Awakening the Unexpected, there's an image uh, on there and it's of a pillar. And the pillar is broken in all these pieces and it's captured in the image about it's about to fall. Well, do we really know how it's going to actually land on the ground? No. Even the best psychic can't tell you that. So that is a lot about this year is that there's a lot of unpredictability, but we can expect that unexpected. Wow, that is a lot to take in all at once. But what I'm getting from that is uh, the idea that we all need to be flexible. You got it, Debbie. That is that is a great, great word to use. Be flexible this year. Um, and the, the other major message that's coming uh, with understanding that there's this awakening process coming in for humanity and this, you know, surprises and twists and turns. And as we could say, a plot twist. A lot of people say, get out the popcorn, you know, and start watching what's going on. Um, but it's simplifying. This year wants to simplify what we have all been doing. And it really stems that's going to uh, really ask us to take a step back from the technology and not to say that we're not going to utilize it and that we won't see these like amazing innovations continue to happen with what we can do with technology. But it's our human relationship to the technology that is a huge top of that list. Simplify it. Because humanity has become so detached with the use of technology that we're losing touch with a lot of things because we're depending on that artificial intelligence a little bit too much and we've forgotten about how to rely on ourselves. So a lot of these surprising things that we're going to see show up are going to ask us to take a good look at that and simplify it. Simplify your life a little bit because everything's gotten a hair complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is this is so true, and uh, in simplifying, are you saying really like to get rid of our technology or to no, not at all. Um, again, it's not about not utilizing the technology because it is there for a reason. It exists, and we can't resist the fact that it's there. We 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 all you know are are living in an era where it's not going to go away. It's not about it going away, but it's understanding our relationship to it. And when we don't need it, that we seem to be, you know, we don't need to be relying on it as much as we actually do. And that's where that, if you can understand that, that that's going to connect humanity on a different level by getting back to the basics. Um, one a, a big thing about a four personal uh, what, four personal you know, four universal year is about the earth and the heart connection. 
And if uh, you know, you understand the, the two words of earth and heart, they are actually utilizing only the very same letters. They're just kind of flipped around a little bit. So if you have a heart, it has to be connected to this earth. And that is another thing that's, you know, the technology is allowing us to get more disconnected from that earth heart space center that is equally very important right now. And do you also see this year as being a year for healing? Very much so. This is a big, when, when you see so many um, interplanet retrogrades like we do, and um, to clarify that a little bit more, so we have three Mercury retrogrades that are going to come in uh, throughout the year, uh, middle of February into early March, the end of June into uh, just about the middle of July, and then we'll have another one middle of October moving into early November. But intertwined with all of that, we've got Venus going retrograde the middle of May until the end of June, and then Mars will retrograde beginning in September and moving into all the way into early uh, November, mid-November, actually. So when we have these interplanet retrogrades, retrograde is a cycle of reflection, whether it's from Mercury, Mars, you know, Venus, or any of the outer planets, which also do a retrograde uh, cycle every year, but they do it for months at a time. And so we're not so advised by astrology to say, oh, you have to not do things. Because a rule of thumb with Mercury retrograde always is watch what you're initiating. Watch what you're putting out into the world. Um, because it's going to start on a shaky foundation or shaky footing, um, riddled with error. You'll have to go back and redo it anyway. Uh, human error is highest under Mercury retrograde than any other time of the year. Uh, and layer in the Venus, which is going to ask us to reflect upon our finances, upon our relationships, upon our value system. Uh, that's all again coming up May, moving into June. And Mars is asking us, to look at what motivates us and reflect upon all of those things. But it is astrological rule of thumb. A Mars retrograde is the energy of a Mercury retrograde times 10. And it's because it is the last inner planet that's so close to the earth. So like anything we're doing of that initiating factor, any initiation, any launch, marriage, business, you name it, don't do it under Mars retrograde either. Or, I mean, you certainly can. <laughs> you just may be like, you know, just you'll just be banging your head up against the wall. So you really want to watch those types of things. Um, and that's what astrology is so valuable because it allows us to understand when it is appropriate to do something instead of so many people have, you know, they have aggravation in their life because they started something at the wrong time. Um, astrology will tell you timing is everything. There's a, there's a rhyme and a reason and a season. Always. Well, I, I want to just ask you briefly about, you know, the, the global uh, predictions that, or if any kind of prediction you can make, because 2019 was a very divisive year in our country. Yes. Are we going to look at more of the same? We need to fix what's broken, that's for sure. Um, can astrology tell you, is that going to ideally be smoothed out in 2020? Probably not. I think the disturbances and the kind of like the upheaval that needs to really happen, because even though we feel it's been an upheaval, it's just been more of like, you know, the emotions are gurgling and everybody's just been, you know, gr -gr 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 -gr. there's not been a lot of solution seeking as much as there should be. And I foresee more so moving into about two to three years from now is when things are really going to, you know, move into a different level. But we certainly do have things uh, coming up this year that, you know, the other thing about Uranus in a four year and not just America, you know, this is a global thing. Um, your leaders, the, the power systems are all going to be challenged, tested, exposed even further for what um, needs to be seen about them. And that's not just here in America, that is happening all over the world. That is not just an American problem. So that is, um, we're like I said, a lot of shock factor, a lot of surprises coming this year um, along those levels. So, you know, we just wanna be 
prepared to be able to, we want to prepare ourselves mentally to not get taken away by things that are beyond our control. Some of these things are beyond our control. You know, not everything is in our control. We're really, who do we really have control over? Ourselves. Well, Sharita, how can people contact you or find out more about you? Uh, best way to reach me always is my uh, email and uh, just pop on my website, sharitastar.com. Uh, and it's simply sharita at sharitastar.com. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Those are my, the only three uh, social media uh, handles I have time to pay attention to. We've been speaking with noted astrologer Sharita Star. We'll be right back with our next guest. Well, you know, I'm a big advocate for using your dreams to help you live your dream life. And with my training as a coach, I can also identify underlying issues that could be keeping you from achieving your goals. And I could offer guidance on how to overcome those blocks. But I'm a coach, not a therapist. And sometimes the issues go so deep that further analysis is needed. This is where therapy comes in. And we're going to discuss this with my guest today, Dr. Sage Breslin. Sage has been a practicing psychologist and is now known for her work as a breakthrough therapist. She's the author of five books, including Daily Pearls and Breaking Through. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Sage. It's wonderful to be here. Oh, thank you. Sage, tell me, what is a breakthrough specialist? Well, a breakthrough specialist is somebody who spends most of their time helping people break through any perceived limits. So oftentimes my clients come in and have just been feeling stuck. They may be living a fantastic life, but they know that there's a little more, uh, something that they're not quite achieving. And they're also aware that they don't know what's in the way. You know, it's very different than if you decide you want to cook a gourmet meal and you don't know how to cook, that's kind of an easy one to find out, right? You have to do a little training or you have to get out a good cookbook or get YouTube up or something like that. But most folks who come in for breakthrough work, they aren't really able to name exactly what's getting in the way. And so a breakthrough specialist actually moves down through the layers and looks for the roots of the problem. So how do you do that? What is like the first step you would take when you deal with the client? Yeah, well, there's a lot of intuitive um, direction, honestly. So when I sit down with a client, I ask them where they are and what their goals are. And then we begin to speak just generally about anything that in the past has gotten in their way. Um, I love to teach as part of what I do so that I can get them to pay attention to their bodies. And you know, I would say most breakthroughs are made viscerally or energetically. They're, it's not, so to speak, a breakthrough of the mind um, because it's not something you just think yourself through. You know, most breakthroughs are very emotional, very um, energetic. And so as they speak, I teach them how to listen to their bodies and I listen to my own body as an intuitive person. And we begin to look to see how the body responds to the story that they're telling me. And I watch and they watch for clues that indicate that there are limits below the surface. Uh, oftentimes I'll ask people, you know, where have you noticed this happening before? Uh, today somebody was talking about feeling uncomfortable about a lot of chaos that had happened at work. And I asked a simple question, when was the first time you remember feeling out of control? And all of a sudden there was this report about uh, a time in their life when they were like six or seven years old, where things were taking place in the household that were really chaotic. And I asked, you know, pay attention to your body right now. Is that the same feeling that you were having? Is that the same kind of feeling when you get when you're at work? And the answer was absolutely. That was the same thing. And we began to work at really un unraveling the memory of being that young and feeling out of control. And then something I do that is a little bit different as a breakthrough specialist is 
I conjure up or bring forth supports for the version of that person at that time in their life. So in this instance, um, this particular person is a pretty deeply spiritual person and loves Jesus, you know, to each his own loves Jesus. And I said, well, what if we were to bring Jesus into the room in that memory for that version of you at eight years old? You know, what would that feel like? And am you know, amazingly started to calm down. And once the calming had happened, we used messages from the adult selves, mine and um, the client's adult self, to remind the younger version of the self that all was going to work out well and that it was important just to retain this information about being supported. And now we'll wait and see because generally speaking, breakthrough work, we can notice the resolutions at earlier versions, earlier layers tend to percolate up and affect the current experience of the now. Mm. Well, Sage, I know that you were trained as uh, what I would call a traditional psychologist and spent many years doing that kind of work. And this sounds different. So what is the difference and what caused you to change your focus? I worked as a trauma psychologist for 25 years. So the... The skill set is actually probably pretty much the same. Um, it's just really the population is different. Um, I would say the population I'm working with now, they may have traumas, but they are the working well. So they are typically um, working, have some form of employment or business that they do. And so they're a little bit more motivated, self-made motivated rather than externally motivated. They don't need to come in to see me, but they want to. And so um, with that investment, that commitment, they tend to be excited about the breakthrough work. I'd say a little bit of what is different is um, maybe how the techniques are used. Um, you know, training as a traditional psychotherapist means having somebody, you know, sit down, describe their problems, listening to the problems, maybe helping them process thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Um, and it may or may not include actual resolution at the time of that event retroactively. Uh, versus breakthrough work is exciting because you can create resolution in the past that then flows forward into the present. So people feel less, um, uh, less impacted by things that happened in the past. Hmm. So do you find that this technique is, is more effective in, in getting resolutions? say that, you know, by design, it's something that I worked on, obviously, for many years to find out, you know, what was that fine tuning? What made a difference? Um, now, when I'm working with clients, I might work with them for three months or six months or even nine months, but they work so quickly and get so much resolution that it's not like the past when a person with a trauma history might stay, you know, 12, 18 months, 24 months, five years, 10 years, because they didn't really feel capable of resolving what was in their history. They just were learning to accept it. So now we're actually using the tool and resolving those kinds of experiences so that they don't impact the performance or the function of today. Can you give me some other examples of some other types of uh, people who are helped by this technique? I have quite a few female clients who um, play small is kind of how I would call it. They keep themselves very boxed in. They do a job or business that is um, constricted from what they can actually do because of their fears of, say, being seen. So one of the most common fears that we break free from is, is being seen. And so if you have a trauma history or you've been abused or exploited in the past, you've, you try to make yourself very small and invisible, right? 
more you feel like a target, the more you feel that um, you believe that if you're seen, then you'll be hurt. So that's something that might sit below the surface and a person who is doing well in their job, but is really worried about what will happen if I do great. Um, in fact, uh, what will happen if I do so good that I am recognized by the CE CEO or the COO and I'm given a, a terrific um, you know, promotion and uh, a raise, but then everybody in the company will know who I am and what I do and uh-oh, what could happen then? So, you know, there are not things that we think about generally. We think about you know, people who are, say, agoraphobic, afraid of engaging with others and going outside. And so they stay in and, and they play small. But we can look at really well-functioning people who are just playing it small because they have a fear of being seen. Just as much as people have, you know, a fear of success, they also have fears of failure. And the breakthrough techniques are wonderful to combat, you know, where did they fail in the past and what was the experience of how they were treated when they failed? You know, if they, uh, you know, didn't win that soccer tournament in, in high school, uh, how has that carried forward with them? We see actually a lot of young sports stars who uh, don't go on to college or they don't go on to successful careers because they, you know, didn't catch that winning pass and, you know, then lost the championship or whatever. And, you know, we see movies about it, but we laugh and we pretend that that's not real. But that is so real. That's exactly the kind of client who you know, could do the breakthrough work and then alter the whole course of their career. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to shift uh, the focus a little bit here uh, to talk about uh, the transformational retreats that you've done all around the world. Uh, tell me a little bit about them, uh, the kinds of uh, subject matter you deal with and, and what the benefits of those kinds of intensive are. Uh, uh, gosh, um... I trained uh, originally in Teotihuacan, Mexico, where you and I met, and um, my intention was really to go and see what it was like to be in a highly energetic location uh, where it's known, you know, breakthroughs are known to happen, and people were known to sort of recalibrate their worlds, and I spent my first year training under Shaman Lee McCormick, and then uh, quickly made my way on to working as a shaman myself, and one of the things that I really loved was inviting clients and their loved ones to come both to Teotihuacan, uh, but also to Peru, to Guadalajara, into the Foco Tonal. Um, we've worked in Tahiti, all over Mexico, um, Mount Shasta, um, Elk, which many people don't know, is uh, about two hours north of Santa Rosa in California. Um, there are places in Hawaii that are very energetically charged. And so, you know, what the opportunity is, is if you can go to where there is a natural energy that can support breakthrough and transformation, it takes much, much less energy to sort of break the person down so that they can allow the emotion and the awareness and insight uh, to become known. Um, so, you know, the value to me is it's, it's a little bit like, um, you know, if you want to bake a cake, you've got to soften the butter first so that it's easier to create dough or, or batter. And I would say this is, like what we do in a highly energetic place is it softens all of the restrictions and constrictions and connections to um, our own ways of doing things. So once that's softened up, we can consider alternative ways to do things and to be. And so if we can sort of peel off the outer layers, the core self can emerge and we can live a life that is much more 
uh, consistent with um, our dream life. Um, very much like what you talked about, rather than remaining, uh, you know, mired up into the life that we've learned to live because our parents have said this is how to do it, or our communities or our uh, spiritual sectors have told us this is how you do, this is how you live, this is how you be. And so intensives allow us to sort of get rid of all of those layers and attach down to the core within us so that we can live a much more authentic life. How can people find out more about you and your work? I ha actually have a couple of different websites. Um, I have Sage Wisdom Institute, which is my, my corporate entity, and that is at sagewisdominstitute.com. Um, one of the services I do is called Come Walk With Me, and I take my services out to the outdoors because when we move our bodies, we're moving both sides of our body and both sides of our brain. So if you've been super stuck, sometimes when you walk and talk, you can actually not only have more insight, but the insight is easier to implement. So um, that is comeandwalkwithme.com. And I have a new website that's coming out and I gotta tell you, somebody hit publish, so it went live. Um, it's not quite finished yet, unfortunately, but it will. Be, it's sagebreslin.com. So even if you just Google my name, you'll find the new website as well. And hopefully here in the next few weeks, that'll all be done. We've been talking about therapy with psychologist and breakthrough specialist, Dr. Sage Breslin. We'll be right back with our next guest. We talk a lot on this program about how you can live your dream life. And today, we're going to be speaking to someone who not only is living her dream life, but is also committed to helping others build the life of their own dream. Dr. Drayvon James rose from poverty to become a successful pharmacist, actor, and the founder of Everyday Peace. And she's the author of the book, Freedom is Your Birthright. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Drayvon. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. So what do you mean by Everyday Peace? I came up with this concept of Everyday Peace through... I think my life experience, I started pursuing what I now call peace at age 17. My brother, I was on my way to college and my brother, who's a year younger than me, gave me a book, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And it intrigued me so much so to, I really knew that whatever Norman Vincent Peale did in that book, that's what I wanted to do for people for the rest of my life. I was on my way to pharmacy school and that was to be a practitioner in health and I knew that wasn't it, but I had already committed. I was going to go through with it. And it took me years of studying. I just kept studying everything I could. I didn't know, I, at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just, I had never heard the term inspirational speaker or motivational speaker. Or I just knew I wanted to help people understand the power that they possess within themselves to create the life of their dreams. And somewhere in the process of living and doing life, I've been a pharmacist for 29 years. And throughout my entire process of being a pharmacist, I, I kept studying and teaching and speaking on what I call evolved for me. I said, this is what I want every day. I read something somewhere that defined wholeness and I adopted it as that's the way I define peace. Initially at 17, I got to tell you, I defined peace as a life with no problems. In my book, Freedom is Your Birthright, I talk about that. So my, it has evolved as I, has, as I have evolved as a person, as a woman, as a being. The definition has evolved, and I'm really comfortable with that definition being what peace represents to me. So let's talk about something that everyone would consider a problem, and that's stress. Stress causes physical ailments. Sometimes it makes it hard to think. It keeps us from living the life of ease that we all want. And you have a formula on how to deal with stress. So can you uh, tell me about that? Well, stress is all, often say, said to be a killer, especially in the health section. It's said stress is a killer. And that's because we don't actually heed the message that it's come to teach us. Whenever we feel stress, the first thing is to do is to be aware of it, to be just aware of it. I am feeling stress in this moment, whatever this, not to try to power through it and say, oh, you know, I can take one more thing. 
acknowledge in that moment that I, I am stressed. Right? Just that awareness brings the attention back to where it should be on self. Because the first thing stress is going to tell you is that something is out of balance. That's our initial cue, that something is out of balance. You've got my attention, and this is a perfect opportunity for me to practice self-care, wellness practice. Something is out of balance. I need to say yes to something. I, I may need to say no to something. I need to slow down. Something needs to change. Awareness needs to take place. Once we accept that we are stressed, then we can look at what needs to happen. Where, where do I need to slow down? Where do I need to say no? Where do I need to say yes? And usually what happens is we're over committing. We're thinking about the future when we only have power in the present. But we're thinking about the past when we have no power back there either. So bringing our attention to the now and realizing that stress is a cue for self-care. It's saying in this moment, you need to care for me. I need to care for myself in this moment. Something needs to change. If, if nothing else, my perspective. Yeah, it is so important. And, you know, I'd love that you have the attention on awareness because so many people just go through life oblivious to what they're doing. You know, they may not even realize that they're mm -hmm. under stress. They're just have that feeling of unease, but don't even, even know how to define it. Most people don't realize that they know they're under, under stress, and that is so key. One of the things I teach people is to do what I call um, stress scans. It's just to, to check our body, check our mind. I divide life up into three categories, health, wealth, and relationships, right? Those, all of our goals typically are health-related, wealth-related, rela related, or are relationship-related. And stress goes in all those categories. But to look at those categories and say, what am I feeling right now? Do I feel any stress in my relationship category? Because stress can act just like a computer virus. It can be destroying things inside of us and be so silent. We don't even know what's happening. So if we don't go in there and look for it, sometimes by the time we become aware that we're under stress, the systems are crashing. We're, you know, we're behaving in manners that we don't want to behave in. We're, we're experiencing things in our mental capacity and our health you know, breakdown that we don't want to experience. So we do have to go in there and be proactive about searching out stress and dealing with it proactively. So what happens when you do actually take a look at yourself and you say, yes, I am under stress. You know, I've got money issues or I have relationship issues or health issues, whatever it is, that's an issue. How do you, what is the first step that you need to take to uh, you know, have a resolution to be able to de-stress yourself. The, fir the very first thing, when you, when you at even attempt to look at your health or your wealth or your relationships, the first thing you have to do is soothe your ego because the first thing the ego wants to jump in and do is try to protect you. It doesn't look like protection, but it's really trying to protect you from any further harm. And because it doesn't have the capacity to protect you, it ends up causing more harm. So the first thing you have to do is to soothe your ego because the ego is looking for somebody to blame for the problem. So if you look and you say, oh, I got, there's a money problem. The ego says, oh, but you're not the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. Or maybe if the ego can't find anybody to blame, it'll blame you. So the first thing we have to do when we notice a problem with any of our areas where we're stressed out is soothe our ego with short, simple command statements. It's, you know, I realize that there's an issue that's upsetting to me. Self-talk is so important, but we can look at this and we can get to a resolution. Thinking about resolution is also stressful. Sometimes the resolution right now is just to be at peace that I am safe in this moment. I am safe in this moment. And that's one of the things I teach in my pharmacy practice is that we have to be concerned about the moment that we're in, not what's gonna to happen to our health tomorrow, because what we do today in our health, in our relationships, in our, in our wealth, what we do today helps to make for a better tomorrow. So just being in this moment will help to soothe us a lot. Yeah, and another thing, and you touched on it briefly, what you're just saying is the whole concept of language. Uh, we often take what we say for granted. We don't even think about it. We just, words just come out of our mouths so much, so often. But the words we speak reveal so much about how we feel about ourselves, especially words that are detrimental and unfavorable. So what is the cost of negative self-talk and how do you stop it? The cost of negative self-talk, I first have to say to you, 
loving ourself and being kind to ourself produces an energy around us because everything is energy, an energetic field, if you will, around us that pulls more loving, kind things towards us. So when our self-talk is negative and downputting, we pull more things in our, in our environment that are going to be negative and putting us down. So self-talk is everything. How we speak to ourselves is so important. And you, if you want a quick, quick, quick tip on how to talk to yourself more positively, pretend like you're in middle school or elementary school is even better. Pretend like that's the person you're talking to at all times. Who amongst us would say, oh, you're so stupid? If you were talking to somebody in the third grade, you'd never say that. You'd never say you're so stupid. So when we talk about ourselves, talk to our younger self, to our little, our little person within, and be soothing and understanding and empathetic when we talk to ourselves. From that place, we attract more things that are soothing and empathetic into our space. Mm. That is so true. And again, that calls into the whole concept of awareness. So when we're aware of, that's mm. one of the things to be aware of, how we speak and the words that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Again, it is so important. Uh, you've also written uh, some books called the Stepping Stone Series, uh, which are each designed to impart an important lesson for transformation. And the first of these is called Freedom is Your Birthright. So how do you define freedom? I divide into two categories your external freedoms and your internal freedoms. And the book deals most entirely really with your internal freedoms, how we choose to see ourselves, the world and our position in the world will influence the, the quality of our lives. So very important, realizing that we have a choice and how we see, how we interpret everything. We do have a choice. We don't have a choice on what, what experiences we're going to have sometimes, right? Sometimes the most unfortunate things happen to the most lovely people. We can all agree that that does happen sometimes. But how we interpret that, either this is going to be the event that causes you to learn and grow and become your best self, or this is going to be the event that breaks you and you'll never move beyond that. We are free to make that decision. So Freedom is Your Birthright is a tiny little book designed to help us understand how, how, how powerful we are in our position to make choices and how important it is to, to own that position, to do just that, to make the choices that advance our lives in the direction that we want to go. But Trayvon, I want to ask you about something that we all deal with and is also as devastating as anything that, that we have to deal with, and that's the whole idea of fear. So talk to me about the role that fear takes in our lives. There are false evidence appearing real, right? And we've all dealt with fear and continuously deal with fear. And this is the thing about fear. Even though we strive never to be fearful, right? That's the goal for a lot of people. There's always going to be something, something out there that, we're, that the ego doesn't know about, a new experience, something that we can't quantify or describe. And those things make us fear. Fear is a deal about fear, though. We have to constantly remind ourselves, our little self, our ego, that we are safe. We are safe to, one, make the wrong decision. There's a lot of fear about that. People just go so fearful that they'll make the wrong decision. And it's okay to make the decision that isn't the most profitable. Because that's how we learn. That's how we absolutely learn. We learn one way that doesn't work, so we'll try another way that does work. Fearful of the unknown in relationships, another learning opportunity. I think the more that we relax, and the more we enjoy life, the more we'll find there are less things to be fearful of. It's, again, freedom is a birthright. How do we approach the unknown as a wonderful opportunity to experience something new. How can people find out more about you? Who can find out more about me in a couple ways. I, I host a weekly a radio program on the Unity Online Radio Network every Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, also on my website, info at drdravonjames.com, where we're doing a 2020 challenge. So go on there and, and hear about that. And then I'm um, all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Drayvon James at Drayvon James and all those sites. 
We've been speaking with author and the founder of Everyday Peace, Dr. Drayvon James. We'll be right back with our next guest. You know, I like to think of myself as a practical person, and I like to use dreams to help give me insights into specific problems or challenges facing me or my clients. But others look at dreams from a spiritual viewpoint, using them to help them connect to source or to their own higher power. Such is the case with my guest today, Jeff Nelson. Jeff is a retired Presbyterian pastor, the author of the book, dreaming in church, and has conducted dream groups in churches. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Jeff. Debbie, it's nice to be with you again. Oh, wonderful. Well, Jeff, let's start off getting into this concept of dreaming in church, because I always thought of church, or in my case, temple, as a place where you sat and recited prayers and sang hymns. So how does dreaming fit into this? It happened um, when I was in seminary. Seminary is a three-year professional uh, degree program for clergy. And I took a class in the theology and psychology of Carl Jung. It was my very first quarter. Um, and I didn't. the class wasn't all that, that spectacular for me. But after the class, I started keeping track of my dreams. And I've been doing so ever since. Um, it's been almost 40, in fact, it's been 45 years now that I've kept track of my own personal dreams. And about 15 years ago, I decided that I would go back and do more um, graduate study. <clears throat> and I got a doctor of ministry degree on my the book title, Dreaming in Church. Um, so I've been, I've been at this for quite a while and, and doing it specifically taking dreams into churches for about 15 years. So, uh, before you went into seminary, did you have any interest in dreams at all, or, or was this something that was brought up by specifically by that class? It was brought up specifically by that class. To this day, I cannot remember a single dream <laughs> before that class. I know I dreamt, you know, we all do, um, but it just had not figured into my my own worldview uh, until I took that class. What exactly do you mean by dreaming in church? I mean using our nightly dreams much more so than our imaginings and fantasies when we're awake. Using our nightly dreams as a as a spiritual practice. Um, I began developing uh, my own practice right at the time I started keeping track of my dreams where I would make a, a very brief note while I was in bed, I had a, 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 a pencil with a flash, a little pen light tape to it. I lost that this last summer, and so I can't show it to you. <laughs> but um, I would use that and then turn it on at night, make notes about my dreams. And then in the morning, I would write them up in a journal, make some brief reflection on them, and then write a prayer for the day. Um, sometimes, sometimes not, uh, reflecting the content of the dreams. And that's, that's what I've been doing for 45 years now. I've studied a number of spiritual practices, uh, walking a labyrinth, Lexio Divina, meditation, praying the Psalms, uh, a number of different spiritual practices that are prevalent in Christian churches, but none of them ever fed me the way my own dream life did. And, and that's why I've stuck with that why I've pursued this, uh, this particular practice and publicizing it, and why I wrote the book. Mm. So can you give me an example of a dream that you had that led to one of these prayers and, and how you actually use that in your day-to-day -day practical life? Um, my favorite <laughs> is, the, uh, is the dream that I had in the fall of 20, 20, 2003, where I dreamt, uh, I was living in Whittier, where I am now at the time, and I dreamt I was back in the house that I lived in in Utah, where my first pastorate was. And in the dream, I went down into the basement where I had my, my own little study down there. But in the dream, there were many more rooms back off the back of my study. And I worked that dream with my spiritual director, and I realized that it I used it as a call to go deeper into my own spirituality and my call from God. 
Um, and as a consequence of that consequence of that dream, I went back to uh, two graduate school programs. I got the Doctor of Ministry degree, and then I got the diploma in the art of spiritual direction. So both of those um, have led me to the practice of recommending to Christians that they first of all pay attention to their dreams, try to write them down, and then work with them in some way. And, and I, I recommend just because it's a, a fairly handy process, my own three-step process of making a note of the dreams, doing a very quick interpretation of it, and then um, using that dream to sort of focus my, my prayers for the day. Um, I've had numerous dreams that have inspired vacation Bible schools, adult Bible studies, sermon illustrations, um, many more than I can even count, uh, the ways in which dreams have spoken to me through the content of my own life to see some place in which to which I believe God is calling me. And I think that's a formula that can work for, um, for Christians in particular, but for anybody who believes there's some sort of higher power that helps guide them in their life, or at least offer them suggestions for guidance in their life. So do you look at dreams as being something that, that you would call a gift from God? <laughs> Most of them, some of them. Um, throughout history, there have been a number of classification um, systems set up. Um, and for me, there's, there are the big dreams that are really important, like the one I shared about going down in my former home. Um, and then there are the dreams that, that generally get not dismissed so much, but relegated as what we would call day residue. That is, um, m many of us will have many dreams throughout the night, but we'll only recall a few of them. And even among those, many of them will be um, dreams of what seem to be inconsequential events of the day before. But I always want to ask myself, if, I've, if I have judged something inconsequential, why did I dream about it? It has come back to me again in my dreams, and that at least calls me to take a second look at whatever that event was. And um, frequently, it was just a matter of, okay, I will pray in that direction, or I will think twice about that thing. Not big life-changing events, mind you, but little reminders that there's stuff that happens in my life that my conscious mind doesn't always register my dreams, if they remind me of those events, they call me back to, to at least look at the event, the event one more time. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's so true. I mean, that's something that, you know, I teach my clients and something I've learned is that you always look at how the dream relates to what's going on in your life. And that's going to give you the insights. And what you do, which is also something that you know, is vitally important, is then taking the next step and actually activating that dream and using it in some practical sense to do something just as you've done with all of uh you know your ministry work which is you know one of the wonderful things about dreams is it enables us to do that you talked a, a bit about you know different practices like meditation um which reminded me of something maybe like semi-spiritual i'll ask you about this uh, because I have a very good friend who is a very religious Jew who goes to synagogue every week, you know, to pray. But she also says that one of the things that she really loves about being in the synagogue is it enables her to meditate as well. Uh, do you see that kind of relationship in, in things that you see in your church? Yes. Um, the, the furnishings of a church are usually rooted in the historical tradition and uh, religious symbolism of the faith. For example, this church I served here in Whittier for 28 years, we had stained glass windows all around the side and the themes of the windows on the one side were biblical material and on the other side they were historical material. One could sit in church and look at those windows and essentially meditate oneself right out of the, of the context now, as a preacher, I might, I might want to say, hey, pay attention to me. 
but I understand the value of the mind going off in a different direction um, based on one of the visual stimuli that's around the, uh, around the edge. Now, I had a dream group in that church for quite some time, and occasionally some of the dreamers in the dream group would talk about their dream as being in the sanctuary and make reference to those windows. So there's a sense in which the physical place that you practice your faith may provide lots of prompts and reminders about the images and the power of those images that are a part of your faith. So I can see that happening in a synagogue in a Buddhist temple and a, 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 a mosque, any number of places that have the religious symbols are prompts to meditation. That is the dream groups that you ran in churches. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. And uh, is there a difference between having a group set in a church versus any place else? Um, yes, if it's set in a church and the, and the dream group members are all believers, we have a certain language in common. We have the language of our, of our scriptures. And as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the visual stimuli around us, whereas in our sanctuary, one half of the windows were scriptural, the other half were historical. But having um, a common language, Christians, Jews, and Muslims all share to one extent or another the stories in the Bible. And those stories are rich in symbolism and um, psychic or spiritual energy. And to be able to tap into those stories through our dreams can be a very powerful um, motivating factor and um, really help us act out on our dreams or act out on some of the deeper images in our religious tradition. Uh, how can people find out more about you and about your book? Um, probably best to um, go to, I have a website that I don't use very often, but it has some material in the book. It's, it's the um, Southern California Dream Institute, and the, and the website is scdinet dot net. And there's a section there that talks about the book and also a little bit about uh, dreaming in Southern California and, and some of that. Uh, but that's the major, the major contact for me, or just uh, contact me directly at gg.nelson at ix.netcom.com. Wonderful. We have been speaking with author and dream expert, Jeff Nelson. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. Until next time, this is Debbie Spector Weissman saying, sweet dreams, everybody. Thank you.